Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you and thanks for tuning in for our broadcast. I pray that the Lord's blessings be upon your life. Here at Bible Christian Church, we believe that the Word of God reveals God and brings blessings into the lives of those who hear it. So our prayer and our hope for you is that as you hear this message, that God would bless you and encourage you in your life. A good friend of mine by the name of G-Dub, well that's his nickname, his actual name is Glenn, a good friend of mine that I'd met well, while doing some time. Um, G-Dub, when he was a younger man, um, ended up getting a prison sentence. G-Dub used to, as the young people would say, love to bust caps. Um, G-Dub got arrested on weapons charges, uh, possession of narcotics, uh, kidnapping, aggravated assault. Um, He's been arrested for trying to flee um, all kinds of different uh, felonies and misdemeanors over his time. And G-Dub was the definition of gangster. Um, I I don't know how to put it any other way, but, well, actually, I do gangsta with an A. Not an E-R, but an A, gangsta. He was really the most gangsta guy I ever ever met. Um, Wonderful brother in Christ. The Lord turned his life around. He's still got some issues that he's struggling with. He's an old man now um, in the prison system. Sounds like the beginning of a TV show. In the prison system, um, there's little unwritten rules, little things that people don't really talk about, but they're obvious. And I'm an observer. I love to watch people. And there's one of these rules that I noticed that... um, a gangster name didn't fit a person and wasn't official unless an, an OG or an older gangster gave it to you. Well, I used to shave my head all the time with razors because, you know, we couldn't get clippers or any kind of electronic things like that, at least where I was at when I started. And I would sell off things from my, my meals and I would trade them and get razors from the other inmates and I would take them and place them in between my fingers and in the shower I would shaved my head completely bald like Mr. Clean. And I got to know G-Dub for a while. We did Bible studies together, and one day, one day he was sitting behind me, and he grabbed my head, and he said, well, Charlie Brown, your head's so round. <laughs> and so that name stuck with me for a long time, and when he would see me, every time I'd see G-Dub, his other name was Mau Mau. Everybody called him Mau Mau. But uh, every time I'd see G-Dub, he'd be like, Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. Like, what's up, G-Dub? <laughs> But I I told you that story. G-Dub had this saying. Before he would start speaking to young people, he always loved to speak to the young cats that came through the system. And he would talk to them. And he would, would, before he would start talking to them, he would say, he would say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, apply the blood, welcome Holy Spirit. He would say that all the time. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, apply the blood, welcome Holy Spirit. And it was something that he did, and he was always reminding himself that, that everything he was supposed to say and do would, should be in the name of Jesus. And it was under the blood of Jesus. And welcome Holy Spirit, and, and be open to the Spirit's leading. And I remember so many times where G-Dub would say things to me that he could not know. And he would, he would give encouragement and he would speak the word of God and he would say things that it was absolutely impossible for him to know. And it, w- it would blow me away. It would, it, would, it would give me chill bumps. It would make me get a little, a little concerned about God's presence. And I asked him one day, I said, Gee, Dub, how do you know what you know? He says, I don't know nothing. He said, quit looking at me. Look at my eyes, but quit looking at me. He says, I don't know nothing. God knows everything. You need to listen and that Holy Spirit will talk to you. It stuck with me. What I see in the church today, a lot of times we, we don't listen. And it's not because we don't want to hear from God. It's not because we don't want to discern his voice. It's because we've got so many other voices speaking to us. 
This generation, you know, my generation is the headphone generation. I remember from growing up when I was a kid to even now, I was one of those kids that always had headphones in. Remember those big old ones that had the big old cushions on them back in the 80s and they had the big old cord that was like, it was curled up and it had that, what was it, the one millimeter or half millimeter or whatever, I don't remember what it is, that big old plug, I don't remember what the, what the specs are on it, but we had those big old headphones and you'd walk away and they, they, they'd trip you up and try to hang you if you try to get, got too far away from your stereo. And then we went to these little earbuds, and it was like, oh, the technology has gotten smaller, and it's so good. And now this next generation, you got Beats by Dre, and now you got kids with the big old headphones again. We're going back to the way it used to be. But we got so many voices speaking into our minds that I think a lot of times we have a hard time discerning God's voice and hearing the Holy Spirit talk to us. What I found is, is the reason a lot of times I, th- I think in my own life, the reason that I don't hear the living spirit talk to me is because i got flesh in my ears. My ears are stopped up by my hands, by my own flesh hands, by my own carnal nature, by the fleshly things of this world and listening to the news or to, to ungodly music or to some movie or TV show that's filling me with all kinds of ideas that are not from God. And it begins... It begins to be very difficult for me to discern between all the voices which one is the Lord. Now, I don't think everybody needs to agree with what I think or how I believe or the doctrines that I teach, but I do want to tell you today and give you forewarning before I preach this message and read these scriptures that I believe in miracles. I believe that the Holy Spirit's gifts are for today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit and his power dissipated after the apostles died. There is nowhere in Scripture where you can back up a doctrine where these gifts ceased. They are continuing in operation today. I believe this. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of other believers who have encouraged me through the Spirit of God. Like I said... I knew a guy, a few of them, he's just one of them. He used to say things that nobody else knew except God. And that confirmed for me that God was with him. That God spoke to him, that he had the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm only going to point out a couple things in this. I'm not going to do an expository sermon over every single verse. I'm just going to highlight a few things that are mentioned in here and give you some other verses of what the Word of God says. And I hope that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, falls on this place, and fills us. We need the Holy Ghost fire in our church and in our community. Amen? Amen. Verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. And here when he's talking about circumcision, maybe this might confuse some people. You've already been circumcised. You're 50 years old. You can't go back and take it back. He's not talking about that if you've been circumcised as a little baby and not unknowingly that now you can't be saved. He's talking about those people who believe they were Gentile believers who had not received circumcision from the law because they were Gentiles. Now that they were believers in Jesus, people were preaching to them the saying that they needed to obey the law of Moses also and be circumcised in order to be saved. That's what he's talking about. So, young men, don't fear if you've been circumcised. It's not, it's not, you're not damned because of it. That was something that was done by doctors and your parents, and they actually say that scientifically, biologically, it's actually healthy for you. <clears throat> Anyways, let me move on from that. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. It doesn't matter either way. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever they may be, will have to pay the penalty. 
Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. This is God's word through the Apostle Paul. May the Lord God bless us all from hearing it, from thinking about it, from meditating upon it. I pray that God's word would change us. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your son Jesus. Father, I thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together with us now, manifest yourself. Show us your love, show us your glory. Lord, we need to be filled with your spirit. We need to be led by your spirit. We need strength. Help us to crucify the flesh, our carnal nature, our human passions and desires that are not of you, those things that are of sin. Help us to kill those things and mortify our flesh that we might live in the spirit. We wrestle not against people, flesh and blood but against powers and principalities and authorities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord, we need spiritual weapons. We need your spirit to be with us, to guide us. Guide us now. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, He mentions the spirit quite a bit in the flesh, quite a bit in this chapter. And he, and he speaks about them being circumcised in their flesh following the law. There's this correlation between the flesh and the law and our carnal nature following after the law, trying to be justified by the law rather than faith in Christ Jesus. And he talks about you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. For through the spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope for. He says in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. It's it's not about what you've done to your body or what you do in your body. It's not some fleshly work. In Christ Jesus, this is a spiritual thing. This is something that's interesting, something that's caused a lot of controversy, and this is all the children should have went to children's church. This is the adult portion of the sermon. What I want you to see here in verse 12, as for those agitators, he's talking about the ones that came preaching circumcision, saying, yes, receive Jesus Christ, but also be circumcised in the flesh. Here the Apostle Paul says, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. There are some people that have trouble with this verse. There's a lot of people that have trouble with this verse. Here's the Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've heard people say, well, the King James says, I wish that they were cut off. Every other version and translation in the English language uses this language about emasculation or cutting themselves all the way off. 
not just the tip. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. The Greek word that is used there, apokopto, is this word about cutting off the flesh. Jesus uses it and he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. He's been using in these past couple verses language about cutting, about removing. He talks about circumcision. You've fallen away from grace. This idea of being cut off from grace. Circumcision. He says you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? He talks about preaching circumcision. The offense of the cross. And he says those agitators, he says I wish that they would cut themselves off. And here's the Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that gives the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Kindness and gentleness. I wish they would go the whole way and just emasculate themselves. Kindness and gentleness, Paul. Sometimes when I read the fruit of the Spirit, this is one of those things that we teach our kids. We got trees, and they'll have the fruit of the Spirit, and there'll be an apple that has love on it, and another apple that has joy, and another apple that has peace. And many church, church people are familiar with the, with the fruits of the Spirit, and we, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and we understand kindness and gentleness. But the problem is sometimes we understand these terms in our language. You see, Apostle Paul aside, let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Who here believes that Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth, he walked in complete obedience to the Spirit, that he was completely filled with the fruits of the Spirit, that he completely exemplified all the fruits of the Spirit? I believe that Jesus Christ, every day of his life, had the fruit of the Spirit in his life. He had kindness and gentleness. And he spoke to the Pharisees, and he said, you brood of vipers, you snakes. In the spirit of kindness and gentleness. Now either I don't, either Jesus needed to be rebuked because he was being mean to the Pharisees, or I don't understand what kindness and gentleness actually means. Hmm. You see, I don't believe Jesus was a wimp. I don't think he was weak-wristed or he, he backed down from anybody. I believe he was loving and joyful and kind and at peace and he was gentle and he was good. But sometimes good men need to be firm. You see, nowadays in the church, sometimes when it comes to kindness and gentleness, we don't think of it in the terms that God thinks of it, and we think of it in worldly terms. If you were to call somebody out on sin or say something's wrong, you'd be like, oh, no, 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 I need to rebuke you, brother. You need to be more kind and more gentle with that person. You were kind of mean. Jesus put together a whip with cords, and he drove people out of the temple with a whip take these things from here do not make my father's house a den of robbers kind meek gentle jesus see in the church we need men who will stand up and be men be strong in the lord and confident <sighs> mm, mm, mm. You've been called to freedom. And there's a verse here. He says, I'm confident in the Lord. Verse 10. I am confident in the Lord. Paul wasn't confident in himself. He was confident in the Lord. I've heard a guy say, I'm not arrogant. I'm confident. As a matter of fact, I'm Godfident. My confidence comes from God. This is not arrogance. This is confidence in God that Paul has. You know, there would be some, I really believe that today if Jesus was to do some of the things that he did in the New Testament, there would be some believers today that would be like, no, now, 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 Jesus, I need to rebuke you and correct you. You're not being gentle and kind. I really, really believe the end of this is, is we don't understand gentleness and kindness as the way that the Lord understands it. Our definition has changed. Let's move on from there. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. He talks about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Let me go to Romans chapter 8. Turn with me there to Romans chapter 8 if you've got your Bible. If you don't got one, move close to somebody that has one. Also, the verses will be up on the screen. <clears throat> 
you don't want to get too close, if you forgot your deodorant, it's okay. Sit by yourself. That's cool. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Paul says something similar to the Roman church. He, he has great wisdom and knowledge that's been revealed to him concerning these things. And I love these scriptures. There's a lot that you can learn from them. It says there in verse 5, Romans chapter 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Now keep in mind here, the flesh here is not just talking about your body, your bodily desires and passions. Like the, the desire for sex, the desire for food, the desire to feel good. Those are things that are tied in with the flesh but more importantly he's talking about the human carnal nature the base nature the desiring base nature that we have that is uh, uh that is sinful that goes against god this is what he means when he's talking about the flesh so it's not just the meat of you it's not just your body it's also your thoughts that are fleshly it's also your desires that are fleshly <clears throat> Minds that are uh, set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. This idea, oh, all over the world, we're all God's children. Well, God might have created us all, but those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. I'm sorry. There are some people that want to back down because of political movements and different things in this country, uh, political correctness and not saying certain things because they're scared that someone might get mad at them. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Speak truth. Don't be afraid. Don't back down. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Also, I want to caution you, don't throw your pearls before swine. I know Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. He also said, judge righteous judgment. Don't throw your pearls before swine because first they'll trample the pearls and then they'll turn on you and try to attack you. You got to preach the truth and you got to tell the truth of what God's word says. But there are some people that are just not going to accept it and it's not worth your time. Jesus said, shake the dust from your feet and move on. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. See, people by nature, people by nature are manipulators. People by nature are selfish and want what they want. You know people are, you know people are manipulators and selfish. But anybody, if you've had a three-year-old, you know that they, see, people laugh. I hear some people giggle and smile because they've had three-year-olds. You know, a little three-year-old will come and try to manipulate you. They'll come, look, mama don't care if I have a cookie. I ain't even asked mama yet. What are you talking about? Trying to play you against your wife. Little three-year-olds. Now, you know if a little three-year-old can be a manipulator and self-serving, a 23-year-old, a 33, a 53-year-old, by nature, humans are self-serving, hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The flesh, what the flesh wants. See, if your body, apart from the spirit, your flesh, your carnal nature, if God was not guiding you, you would just do everything for your own satisfaction. You see people doing that all the time, all over the world. They don't care about God. They don't have the spirit. They're void of the spirit. They're guided by their carnal nature. So when you see on TV things that talk about them getting rich and, and being happy and having a smile on their face, get the best pickup truck. This one, JD Empower and Associates have rated number one buy this pickup truck and then you'll be happy move to this area over here by the beach and then you'll be happy get a good job and make lots of money and then you'll be happy and people of the world flock to these things that make their flesh feel good those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please god you however are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the spirit if if there's a condition for you computer programmers, you understand if, if, only if, this is not true unless if this, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. That, that begs the question, does the Spirit of God live in you? Have you asked yourself that lately? And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. 
You can't say it any plainer. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. We are all created by God, but we are not all God's children. This is the truth from the Bible. I didn't write this. Your Bible says it. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. The Spirit gives life. I'm so glad. I love that the Spirit guides certain things and teachings and the way that things go because you brought the fruit and the seeds and you didn't know I was going to talk about an organic gospel this morning. Did you know that the gospel is organic? The truth of God, the gospel is organic. It's a living thing. That when the seeds of God, Jesus spoke of the, of the gospel as seeds. He speaks of the Spirit as giving life. The gospel's life-giving. It's organic. Organic means something that is living and alive, something that can give life and can be reproduced. Organic is something that is pure. When we think about foods, or organic foods, we're thinking of naturally grown foods without all the chemicals and man's intervention. Organic. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If Christ is in you, though even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit that's spoken of in the the book of Galatians in chapter 5, in our text, that fruit that is spoken of there, these are not things that you can work up. The fruit of the Spirit are things that are, are organically grown within you. And then come out out of you. Fruit on a tree is not something that the farmer comes along and places on the tree. The fruit of a tree is something that is organically grown from the inside out. The fruit of the Spirit, love, is not some act that you do. Love is born in the heart of a person by the Spirit of God. And that love comes out organically and turns into works of love and service. But it comes from the inside. It's organically grown. It's life-giving. The fruit of the Spirit, what's interesting is most fruits, not all, but most fruits contain seeds. When you love and you have joy and you have real spirit love and real spirit joy that comes from Jesus Christ and you give it to others and they feed on that love, they feed on that joy, they receive those seeds from that fruit. And it is possible that Christ would be born in them also. Amen. The Spirit gives life. Because of righteousness. This is the way it is. These are not metaphors. Listen, these are not metaphors and simple concepts and ideas here. This is not some way of explaining it. What Paul is saying that this is the reality. This is real. Jesus spoke about it the same way. When he spoke about the Spirit of God, he was not talking about a thing or an idea or a concept. He said he's a person and he will come and he will live with you. Mm. Verse 11, Romans 8, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The gospel is organic. It's life-giving. It's reproducing. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Yes, God has created everybody on the globe, everybody that has ever been and everybody that will be. God is the creator of all life. But we are not all the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Do you have his Spirit? We just saw the verse that says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Do you have his Spirit? Do you know? Did somebody tell you that you have his Spirit, or do you know? Let's see what Jesus said about it. John 14, for some people, they have a hobby horse, right, Jake? And this is my hobby horse. I love John 14. He knows this. He's heard me preach it from the pulpit. He's heard me preach it over at the the seniors 
uh, with the seniors over there at uh, the manor. I love John 14. This is my chapter. I love because it's this intimate setting that Jesus has with his disciples personally. And he talks about what he wants to do with them. John 14, starting in verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit has many names. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. The fire of God. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. See, there are some people that just don't understand you and can't accept you. It's because you're walking in the spirit and flesh cannot understand the spirit. It is not discerned by the natural man. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 2, it says the spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is judged of no man. Can't understand him. It's okay if the people at your work think you're a little strange because you love Jesus. That is all right. You just keep on loving Jesus. Sometimes I get to saying, and I get to fighting, and I get to warn, and I start saying, it is written. I start going to the word of God, and it is written. I'll be in my car at a stoplight. It is written. And look over at the person sitting next to me. He's like, what is that guy doing? It is written. Jesus, amen. The world cannot accept him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. You will know him, not know about him, not have information. This is not about mental assent. This is not about mentally saying, oh, I understand that. No, do you really know in relationship, in covenant relationship, in marital intimate relationship that causes new life to be brought forth from your womb? You're the bride of Christ. Yes, you men, you are the bride of Christ. It's all right. In Christ, there is no male and female, but you are the bride of Christ. And you have a spiritual womb, and he's trying to give you the seed of his word that you might birth his fruit into this earth. Mm, amen. That was for free. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. It's organic. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. On that day, you will realize. Realize. Realization. Reality. This is not a concept. This is not an idea. This is not some ethereal, esoteric thing. It's reality. Jesus says, this is the reality of you, my disciples. This is the reality. This is what real life is like, the spirit with you. Do you know that the spirit's with you? Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, I haven't experienced this. I don't know about the spirit. Keep listening. The word of God will give you faith. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will teach you all things. This is how G.W. used to say stuff to me that he could not know. It's because the Holy Spirit taught him to him. And he just used his mouth. He surrendered himself to what the Spirit was saying. And he said it with his mouth. And God did miracles and worked miracles. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If strangers and unbelievers come into your midst. And you're all speaking in tongues. They're going to be like, y'all are mad. We don't understand a single thing you're saying. But if someone was to come in. And you're all prophesying. You're all speaking by the Spirit. They're going to say. They're going to be convicted in their heart. And they're going to fall down and say, God is really among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, go study it out. This is available for every believer, not just the preacher at the pulpit, not just for an elder or a deacon. If you believe in Jesus Christ, this gift is for you. The gift of having God's very presence with you. Well, isn't God everywhere? I'm talking about his Holy Spirit living in you, with you, walking with you. Yes, God's present everywhere, but he wants to fill you. 
He wants to fill your life, every bit of you, everything you see, everything you say, everything you think. He wants his spirit to just saturate you. We use that word uh, about the water, about baptism, about being placed into Christ. He, you need to be placed into the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, on that day you'll realize that I am in my Father and you are in me. What did he say? You are in me. It not only is the spirit of Christ in you, but you are in him. Do you realize where you are? Do you realize? Oh my God. See, in eternity, eternity is a different timeline. We're experiencing things in this linear fashion where we're going through time, but your spirit is eternal. All these things are fulfilled. Paul goes so far as to say, you are in Christ and Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That we have been raised with him and seated in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3, chapter 2, something like that. I know where it's at. I could find it if I had to. <clears throat> Go with me to Acts chapter 19. We're going to talk about some things. I'm running out of time, but it's all right. Is this good? Is this helping anybody? Is this encouraging anybody? I hope so. It's encouraging me. I'll just preach it until I'm happy. I'll run across the ceiling and go home. We'll be fine. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Do you realize that there are people that believe that haven't even received the Holy Spirit, that haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit? That's sad. There might be people in this church right now, in this building right now, that you don't know very much about the Holy Spirit. You've never received the Holy Spirit. You didn't even know you could. There's even a false doctrine going around where people are saying, well, if you believe in Jesus and you're baptized, you automatically receive the Holy Spirit. Where is that found? There's a promise. Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He, he makes that promise. Acts chapter, was Acts 2.38? Acts 2.38, right? Repent, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say when, but it is a promise for you. Well, look here, New Testament. Look, this is after Pentecost. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, which is good. Be baptized for repentance. He told the people to believe in the one who coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you've been baptized more than once, that's okay. Don't feel bad about it. It's okay. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Why this detail about 12 men? It's interesting. It doesn't name them. The story moves on. 12 men, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12, 24 elders, two sets of 12. This is the way that God governs. This is the way that God sets up authority. You know that he sets up authority in the church through his Holy Spirit? It's through his Holy Spirit that he places people in the church, gives them their gifts. Then there are some who will say, well, in this instance, they, they hadn't been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, Peter said if you repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then you receive the Holy Spirit, right? Right? Did you know that you can be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and not receive the Holy Spirit? Go to Acts chapter 8. Same book. Go back to chapter 8. Let me show you this. <clears throat> it is possible. It is possible to be baptized into Jesus, to know Jesus, and not receive the Holy Spirit. I didn't write this. This is what the Bible says. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that, there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now step back for a minute. This did not happen in the matter of two verses. When they sent them to Samaria, it probably took several days. It could have taken weeks. We don't know how long their trip took. So these people were believers for quite a while before they ever received the Spirit. 
Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Mm. Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And here we see these apostles, these believers who had the Holy Spirit, placing their hands on them and they receiving the Holy Spirit. And one would say, well, okay, well, we don't have the apostles to place hands on us to receive the Holy Spirit. I tell you, the Bible doesn't say that you have to have hands laid on you. Did you know that there are some people that simply hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit falls on them even before they're baptized? There are some people that think that it goes in this certain order. You need to repent. You need to be baptized. Then you get the Holy Spirit. That's That's not what the scripture teaches either. It teaches that they go together, but it doesn't teach that they go in any certain order because eternity doesn't have a timeline. Eternity is eternity without beginning, without end, forever. Let me show you. Go a couple chapters over. Acts chapter 10. This is Peter talking to the Gentiles. This actually applies to us. I think... For the most, I think everybody in here is probably a Gentile. I don't know if we have anybody of any Jewish or Hebrew lineage, do we? If you do, cool, awesome, welcome. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 34. He's talking to Cornelius in the band. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel. Listen to that. You know. You're not ignorant of this. You Gentiles know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. First of all, if Jesus needed to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and power in order to go around doing good, what makes you think the church is going to get away with it without it? What makes you think that you can do God's will and do what God has called you to do without the Holy Spirit leading you? You need the Holy Spirit. He is God. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. It's a preaching of the gospel. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. We are to preach that he came, he bled, he suffered, he died, he rose again, and he's coming again to judge. Oh, that's why we do communion. We declare his death till he comes. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins, excuse me, through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. While he was still speaking, he didn't touch them. The Holy Spirit did, though. While he was speaking, while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit came on them. They were astonished, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. They hadn't been baptized with water yet. Now he commands them to be baptized. It's important. These things go together. First John, John puts it this way. He says, there are three that testify in the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three are in agreement. The blood, the preaching of the gospel, Jesus Christ. The water, baptism, the spirit. These three go together. You notice that in all three of these instances, these these things are present. Belief in Jesus Christ, baptism into Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit coming on people. These three are together in one. Maybe you've thought all your life, maybe you've been a believer for a while. You know that God's with you, you love God, you know the word of God, but you don't know if you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about how in the book of Acts, there are several times, I don't have time to go through it, I don't have the scriptures to put up on the, on the screen, but there are several occasions, especially in Acts chapter 4, where the believers, Peter and John, they were preaching the gospel They had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. 
Go search this out for yourself. Take notes if you want to. But Acts chapter 4, they go and they preach and they get persecuted. Then they go back to the other believers and they begin to pray with them. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. Weren't they already filled with the Holy Spirit? That tells me that the Holy Spirit filling is not a one-time thing. You do not just receive Jesus, get baptized, get the Holy Spirit, and that's it. You have an opportunity. I want to tell you, I believe this with all my heart. You have the opportunity every day, every morning to take up this flesh out of your bed, to resurrect it from that sleep and receive the Holy Spirit of God in order to guide you through your day. That every single day he can fill you with this Holy Spirit. Do you drink water once? Do you drink water once? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? All these verses speaking about people receiving the Holy Spirit, all these verses about Jesus walking in the Holy Spirit, Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks to Elemas the sorcerer, and he says, you unrighteous, you devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Gentle now, Paul, gentle. Scripture says he was filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at the sorcerer, and says, you enemy of all, right, un, or, or, you enemy of all righteousness. You're going to go about blind. Someone else is going to have to lead you. And he blinded the man. Full of the Holy Spirit, full of the spirit of gentleness and kindness, Paul blinded a man. There's some people here that you don't really believe in all the mystical mysticism and the spiritual aspect of your faith. You believe that Jesus came, you believe in his physical resurrection, all those kinds of things, but the spiritual war that's going on, for some reason you have trouble seeing. Even though the Bible over and over and over again says that our war is against witchcraft and sorcerers. Do you not realize that? Have you read the Bible? When Moses came up against Pharaoh, who was it that opposed him? The magicians. When Saul was having trouble and he wanted to find out what was going on and he went to the witch of Endor, she was a diviner, she was a spiritist. When the apostle Paul was preaching with Silas, there was a little girl that followed him that had a spirit of divination. Elemis the sorcerer, Bar-Jesus, Simon the sorcerer. The Bible is filled with all these characters that oppose the spirit of the living God. Sorcerers, witchcraft. The Bible, here in Galatians chapter 5, it talked about the works of the flesh are obvious, the acts of the flesh, and witchcraft was one of them. One of the problems that is happening with our youth right now is they're, they're spellbound by the witchcraft that's going on all the time. All the time. Esoteric wisdom and these, these kinds of things that are being shared. Uh, new age movements. You know, you see the Star of David. Don't you realize that? In, is anybody, anybody familiar with the Catacoma? I think it's Cata, uh, Catacoma, Mexico, I believe is how you pronounce it. It's about, it's southwest, uh, southeast of Mexico City, probably about 150 miles, 180 miles. And there are stars of David all over the place, a six-pointed star, a hexagram where people sacrifice daily goats and chickens. This, this town makes its money. Vicente Fox went down there and blessed the place and gave his approval for what they were doing down there. And that place is a boom town for witchcraft. This stuff's happening all over the world. You know, in Serbia, in Serbia, there are many places there where diviners and sorcerers and witchcraft and all kinds of spiritual things are happening there. And it's a way of life and it's normal. The church in America, we, we call this stuff mumbo jumbo and it's, it's not real. Then why does your Bible have God saying stay away from it? Why would God command you to stay away from diviners, spiritists, mediums, witches, sorcerers, if it wasn't real? See, what I believe is happening is a lot of these people, they're, they're, they're idol worshipers, and they, they call up the spirits of the dead, and they call up different demonic spirits, and those spirits give them power. I've seen it in my own life. When I was a kid, there was this guy, this guy Sherman, when I was a kid, we used to, he, I don't even want to get into it. There was just so many things that I'm ashamed of. But he was a witch. 
See, the thing that's troubling to me is that some believers, they're fighting so hard against like the satanic temple that wants to erect a statue in Oklahoma City and all these different things. And they're fighting against these openly devil-worshipping societies. Don't you realize that real spiritists, real witches, real satanists, they don't wear black. They don't paint their faces. Real satanists, real witches that are divining against the church do you know they wear business suits? There's a girl by the name of Nicole. Her handle on the internet is Pisces247. I'll call her out. I don't care. She tells people about witchcraft and the left-hand path on the internet all the time. She's from San Francisco. She told her followers recently, just within the last couple months, she had a podcast where she was telling her followers, she said, quit ostracizing yourself from the church. Quit telling people you're a witch. Quit telling people you follow the left-hand path. Don't you realize it's a path of darkness? Their ignorance is your weapon. All the resources are in the church. So teach Sunday school. This is a witch saying this. This is a pagan who worships demonic spirits, who claims to be a bride of Satan, openly, is telling other Satanists and other witchcraft believers, don't tell everybody. Go to church. There's a fight coming, she says. You read your Bible. Your Bible talks about a fight coming and that there's a false prophet that's going to arise and have many signs and wonders to deceive the elect. He's going to come with signs and wonders to deceive people and people are going to be like, this person has power so they must be telling the truth. Don't you know that Jesus even said, believe me for the work's sake. The works that Jesus did were proof and evidence of his claims. Do you know the false prophet's going to do the exact same thing? Do you have confidence in the spirit? Do you really? This is not playtime. We do not have time to play church. I'm telling you the end is coming near. It's coming quick. It's coming fast. For any of you that have lived any length of time and you've seen the news and you've seen what's gone around the world, those of you especially who have been in the military and have been around the world and seen the conditions of other countries and the different things that are happening, Satan is trying to destroy people. The devil is trying to destroy our homes and we cannot afford to play church. Well, maybe I have the spirit. You need to get the spirit. What the church needs now is to be filled with and baptized with Holy Ghost fire that we might have power to preach the gospel, to lay hands on people, to get them saved. Do you know that nobody's going to get saved unless the Holy Spirit shows up? You can preach, the, you can talk about what the Bible says all day long. Go on radio and go on podcasts. You have atheists that will quote the scripture, but it's not enough to quote the scripture. They quote the scripture all day and it doesn't change their hearts. I know atheists. I have friends who are atheists that are against God. And they can quote the scripture better than I can. And I know they don't have the Holy Spirit. Can you tell I'm passionate about this? The reason I am is because I have kids. Not just my physical kids, but I have spiritual kids that I fear for that are playing church. It's time for us to buckle down, get in the word and pray and ask God to give us power and the ability to hear his voice and follow him. I'm tired, y'all. I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired. This world drains on my mind. I look to God's word for peace and joy, but here, we are not trying to build an earthly kingdom. Do you realize that? The Bible says that we ought to be looking for that day and hastening it along. That we ought to be looking for the coming of the Lord and doing everything we can to speed it up. I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to just do what the Holy Spirit has for me to do and walk in what he's told me to do so that way I can get my job done and go before him unashamed and he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You did what I told you to do. And if I don't have the Holy Spirit, if I'm not listening to the Spirit's voice, if I'm not listening to the word of God, how am I going to fulfill my mission? Do you know that you are here on assignment? God did not place you here so you can build up your life in this earth. He placed you here because he has an assignment for you to fulfill. And when you're done, he's taking you home. I would rather go home.
So my mission is to preach the gospel, to preach the word of God, to teach people what the word of God actually says, not what we think about it. That's one of the worst questions for you volunteers and teachers. One of the worst questions you can ask in a Bible study is, what does this mean to you? Quit asking that question. Start asking this question. What is God saying by this scripture? Now, what does that have to do with you? What is God saying? What is the Spirit saying? I'm not going to ask anybody to, I don't want to lay hands. I'm not, I'm not one of these people that you got to lay hands because we saw in the scripture you don't have to lay hands. You could just hear the gospel and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you that the thing that you must have is you must have a desire for him. Do you really desire God? There are lots of people that want to go to heaven. There are lots of people. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to live in a paradise. But there are lots of people that don't want God to be there when they get there. Because God is pure and holy. God is a judge who will tell you when you're wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. See, people want all the blessings and people want all the gifts and the good things, but they don't want to be convicted. They don't want to be turned from their sin. They want to go to heaven, but they don't want God. I'm asking you, do you really want God? Not to be a church member, but to be in and part of the church and be the church yourself, because the church is not a thing. The church is not a place. The church is people. The church is people. You are the church. When, when Paul was writing this letter to the Galatians, he was writing to the church in Galatia, the people, not the building, not the organization. This is not about the organization. This is about an organism, a living thing that grows and feeds and feeds other and reproduces. The church is an organism, a living organic thing that gives forth life by the power of the Spirit. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're bored. I don't know what it is, but maybe you want me to move on and get to the point. You need to ask. You need to quit thinking and open up your mouth and ask. Ask God. Have you ever asked for him to fill you with this Holy Spirit? Have you ever asked for him, for him to put his presence on your life, for his power to be in your life? Have you asked? Continue to ask. I want to tell you. If you've ever asked, I want to tell you to continue to ask. Luke chapter 11, and I'll end with this. It says there in verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Uh, there's a little footnote in the Amplified that says this. Charles B. Williams, who wrote the New Testament translation, it's a commentary, he says, The idea of continuing or repeated action is often carried by the present imperative and present part of participles in the Greek. Well, what does that mean? For some of you, that sounded like Greek to you. What he means by this is, this is the way it would be properly translated in Greek. I say to you, ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. To him who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door shall be open. Present imperative. The Greek is saying this is something that's constant, not a one-time thing. Ask and keep asking. For everyone who asks and, keep a and keeps asking receives. The one who seeks and keeps seeking finds. And the one who knocks and keeps knocking, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? These are the words of Jesus. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Have you asked God for the Holy Spirit? Have you asked for the Holy Spirit to come into your life, to come into your family, to come into this church and change us, guide us? We need to hear his voice. I'm telling you, we can't play. We need to follow the Spirit's mandate. We need to be following what he's saying to us. Have you asked? How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He says this in the context of telling them to ask and keep on asking. He says, if you're a father and, and your kid asks you for a fish, will you give him a snake? He relates, he correlates asking and keep on asking to food. Now, if any of you asks for a fish, tomorrow you're going to be hungry again. So will you not ask your father again for a fish again? 
How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to the ones who get up every day and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide me this day. Give me my marching orders. What do you want me to do when I get to work? Who can I bless on my lunch break? And when I get home, what do you want me to say to my wife that will build her up and cause her to know your love? What are you saying to me, Spirit? God, fill me. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. So you may already have the Holy Spirit. You have a glass of water. The filling of the Holy Spirit is when God takes a pitcher and starts to pour in and that glass that you have full because you have the Holy Spirit begins to overflow. And then it begins to fall on all those around you. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit like that, that everyone who is around me, that hears what I say, sees what I does, is touched by the Holy Spirit, that their sins are washed away and they receive forgiveness and know the love of Jesus. That is why we need the Holy Spirit. People need to know the love of Jesus. People need to be washed from their sins. We need to preach the gospel and we need his Spirit's power to guide us. I want to do something different today. I want to ask you to do something with you. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to raise your hands right where you're at, if you want to sit, if you need to get on your face, get on your face. Don't care what anybody else around here is thinking. Here's the thing. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you need to stop everything you are doing. I don't care about your job. I don't care about your family. I don't care about nothing. If you do not have the Holy Spirit of God, you need to stop everything until God shows up in your life and changes you. Nothing else is going to matter if you don't have him. Don't you understand that? This is the most important thing, is having Jesus Christ. Having his spirit in you. If anyone does not have his spirit, he does not belong to Christ. So what I want to do in this invitation time, I want you to pray. And I'm going to pray too. And we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit would come into our lives, into our family, into our children. Your children might be three years old. They can receive the Holy Spirit at three years old. I believe it. If you are 90, you can still be filled. It doesn't matter. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit come into this church, come into our lives, come into our families. We need to hear his voice. We need God to show up and guide us. Will you pray with me? Stephanie's going to start a song, and if you want to sing along, the lyrics are going to be up on the screen. You can sing along. But as the song is going, begin to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your wife. Pray for your children. And ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Ask God to show up. Ask God to lead you and guide you. Will you do that with me? Will you do that with me? Let's do that now. I'll begin. I'll begin to pray. And as I pray, you pray also. If you feel like if the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you and tells you you need to go lay hands on so-and-so across the room, do not sit there. Get up and go lay hands on that person. If the, if the Holy Spirit tells you I need to give this scripture to so-and-so over here, do not sit there. Get up and follow the Spirit voice and do what the spirit is calling you to do let's pray let's pray holy spirit go ahead stephanie and start holy spirit come now holy spirit fill our hearts now fill our minds holy spirit we need you to guide us and lead us. holy spirit of christ jesus jesus lead us holy spirit we need you we need your grace we need your mercy guide us in this church teach us what we ought to do teach us what we ought to say there's nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence lord i've tasted and seen of the sweetest of my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence
presence now more than ever in this dark hour. We need the light of God's spirit. We need the light of his word. We need his truth, his gospel to guide us. Do you have his spirit? Do you know him? Do you know him today? Everything that you're going to do, everything that God wants to do through you, he's going to do by the power of his spirit. He's going to do it in the name of Jesus. It's going to be according to his word. We believe in God. We believe in God. And people talk about the Trinity, and the Trinity is not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. You realize that? It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now what the Bible says, Jesus said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have life, but the scriptures point to me. I'm not disvaluing or or devaluing the scripture. The Holy Bible is important because it leads you to Jesus, but here's the thing, you need to take that step and say, now that it's shown me Jesus, I want Jesus, I want his Holy Spirit. Don't you want everything that he's promised you? He's promised you his very presence. Ask for it. By the promise of Jesus, he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Keep asking, and it'll be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be open. Will you pray with me now? Father God, fill your church with your Holy Spirit. Every person in here that has a desire to know you, to know more of you, to know more of Jesus, to know more of your word, to have your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless them now and answer their prayer. Give them your Holy Spirit. Give them your word. Give them Jesus. Give them everything that you promised them now. Father, guide our church. Lead us by the Holy Spirit. Lead us by your word. Teach us. Guide us into all truth. We need you. We need you now, and we know, Lord, that by your strength, by Christ Jesus, we can do all things. Everything that we need to do as a church and everything that we need to do in our families, everything we need to do as individuals, you give us the strength in Christ Jesus, and you give us the strength through the spirit of your power. Be with us now. Be with us now. Hello. I want to thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. I hope that the message was powerful and that it it impacted your life and encouraged you. I want to ask you, while you were listening to the message, was God speaking to your heart? Did you feel any conviction? Maybe maybe you're a believer in God, you're a believer in Jesus, and, and you feel like God is calling you to change, maybe to change the path that you're on. Or maybe you've never made a decision to to follow after Christ, uh, to be a believer. If that describes you, I want you to pray a prayer with me right now. Will you do that? Just pray like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. Please forgive me. I know that the Bible says that you shed your blood for my sin and that you paid the ultimate price at the cross. And I thank you for that. Forgive me now and cleanse me from my sin. Come into my life. Change me. Give me strength to follow after you. And I will continue to praise you and believe in you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you that the Bible says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess his name, you will be saved. That's amazing news. I also want to advise you and caution you that following after Jesus is not always easy. But what can help is if you get yourself a Bible and read about him. Pray to him every day. And also try to find a group of friends like a church or a Bible study or a prayer group you can be a part of so you can surround yourself with loving and supporting people who are a positive influence in your life. That will make your journey with Christ that much better. If you've been blessed today, I just want to encourage you to share that blessing with others. Share it with us. If you received something from this message, shoot us an email or go to our Facebook page and like it. 
Or maybe go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there. You can also look at our archive of other videos and sermons and the special music that's been shared by the people of God here. I want to encourage you. There's a reason why you tuned in. There's a reason why God has brought this message to you. God is with you. Remember always that if God is for us, who can be against us? God bless.